At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. I'm delighted to have with me today Steve Rolls. Steve is someone who is uh, rarely out of the news. He's uh, always out there tweeting and talking about drug policy and, and trying to bring a bit of common sense and rationality and also analysis to the, uh, the debate. So welcome, Steve. Hi there, David. I think it would be useful to kick off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got into this topic or this field or this job or whatever it is. I, I kind of bumbled into it. I mean, I, my, my academic background was a degree in geography and a, a master's in um, development studies and international relations. Uh -huh. um, I did a, a year working for the Medical Research Council and I was working for Oxfam campaigns for a while. And then this organisation called Transform Drug Policy Foundation set up by Danny Kushlik in Bristol. Mm -hmm. And this was about 20 years ago, amazingly. And um, for better or worse, I was the, I was basically the first person he employed once he'd got some funding. And we have been banging away ever since. So Transform Drug Policy Foundation is now a, a registered charity. And our mission is to improve drug policy outcomes and to educate the public and policymakers about what effective drug policy means. And to that end, we do a whole range of analysis and advocacy work around drug policy and drug policy reform. And I guess Transform's sort of core focus has been partly to critique the failings of the kind of enforcement-led war on drugs paradigm and partly to propose alternatives. And amongst those alternatives is this idea that we need to end prohibition and legally regulate drug markets. Historically, it's been quite contentious, but you know, over the 20 years that Transform's been working, it's become less so. So it's moved from very much the sort of margins and fringes of public debate into the mainstream. And it's also moved from theory into practice. So it's not something that we're just talking about anymore. It's actually happening in the real world, mostly with cannabis, but increasingly the debate is moving to other drugs as well. So that's what we do. And that's what we've been doing both in the UK and internationally for, for two decades now. And it feels like we're beginning to win the debate. So why was it set up in Britain? I mean, you know, it's not necessarily the most obvious place to have a, a campaigning group about drug policy international. Well, I mean, it was it was set up by Danny Kushlik, who was who, who's this sort of, you know, visionary genius who just, you know, 25 years ago or so, he he, he was working as a, a drugs worker in prisons. Uh -huh. And he became increasingly convinced that a lot of the people who he was trying to help who had drug problems in prisons really shouldn't have been there. Um, they had been pushed into uh, offending because of the fact that their their behavioural choices had been criminalised. And the worst possible thing to be doing with these vulnerable people who often had multiple problems was to be criminalising them and chucking them in prison, which is an intrinsically traumatic and brutalizing environments that wasn't helping their health and wasn't helping their mental health and wasn't helping their life life prospects. So as he kind of explored that personally on his own personal journey, he, you know, he soon concluded that at the heart of it, there was a structural problem around the policy and laws of prohibition and that banning drugs didn't get rid of them. It simply handed control of those markets to organized mm -hmm. crime groups and unregulated street dealers and that criminalizing people who use drugs wasn't preventing drug use or deterring drug use. It was just making people who use drugs' lives more difficult. It was making drug use more dangerous, encouraging high-risk behaviours, and creating all the problems we have with a criminal-controlled drugs market. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for all the way from you know Afghanistan and, and, and the jungles of Colombia, all the way to the streets of, of, of London. It, it was fueling crime, it was fueling corruption, mm 
It was damaging international relations and social relations at a local level. It was it was stigmatizing tens of millions of people with criminal records. And it, it was achieve, achieving none of its goals. It wasn't eradicating mm. drug mm. markets. It wasn't deterring drug use. It seemed to be doing the exact opposite. You know, not only was it not doing what it was supposed to do, this war on drugs, it wasn't getting rid of drugs. It was making drugs more dangerous and creating mm. a whole raft of other problems. And if you follow that, that the sort of logical corollary of that, if a drug policy is not working, we should be looking at what the alternatives are. And really, it's about dealing with reality. And the reality is drugs are here whether we like them or not, whether we morally approve of drug use at a personal level. From a kind of pragmatic policy level, we have to deal with the world as we find it. And throughout history, people have sought to alter their states of consciousness. People have sought to use drugs. And banning them doesn't make them go away. It just makes them more dangerous and hands control of those markets to criminals. So our policy, our approach is really a fundamentally pragmatic one that given the realities of drug use, we should be managing that in ways that in, improve policy outcomes rather than mm. uh, make those policy outcomes worse. And we think that involves responsible public health and human rights guided regulation of drug markets rather than a futile ideological quest to eradicate mm. them using punishment and police enforcement. You certainly become world leaders in terms of this, the debate. And I, I gather you've now got offshoots in Mexico and maybe other places. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, I mean, there, there's a number of organisations quite similar to Transform operating around the world. There's a really thriving and positive network of, of drug law reform and policy reform organisations who all bring different things to the table. So there are harm reduction organisations, there are prison reform organisations, there are human rights groups, there are groups that reflect, re reflect the interests of different impacted communities, whether that's prisoners or mm. drug crop growers or um, disproportionately impacted marginalised communities, sex workers. There's all kinds of different interest groups. And we all work together under the umbrella of, of, of various international groups like the International Drug Policy Consortium to do advocacy locally, regionally, nationally and, and internationally. Um, and Transform's one of uh, a number of organisations who does operate internationally. And we do have a partnership with an organisation called Mexico Unido Contra Delincuencia in Mexico, uh, who've been leading a lot of the reforms we've seen there, including the Supreme Court challenges that led to the legalisation of cannabis in Mexico and wider reforms in Central and Latin America. And we have alliances and partnerships with other organisations across the world. So, you know, illegal drug markets are international Organised crime groups don't recognise or respect international law or national law. They operate internationally. And so drug law reform has to operate internationally as well. And of course, drug laws operate internationally under the UN Drug Convention. So this isn't something that you can have too parochial a view about because both drug laws and drug markets are international. So if we're trying to you know, get to the heart of this, we have to operate internationally as well. Looking back now over 20 years of doing this, um, you've seen the UK pursue policies which have failed. You go to the UN quite frequently, you're often in Vienna or where else there are, there are meetings in New York. Where is the problem? Is, is, it, is it the countries? Is it the international community? How, how do you, you know, why has it proved such a challenge to get reason into this debate? I mean, I think it, it it comes down to the sort of um, going back in history that that the, the, the fight against drugs, this concept of a war on drugs, mm. you know, the, the, the same kind of marginalisation of reason and, and science that we see in more conventional war has very much dominated this public discourse. The, the, the whole issue has been very kind of polarised as this, as this clash between sort of good and evil. Um, and, you know, if you're, the drugs are evil and anyone fighting them is automatically good. So the, the, the sort of war on drugs became, becomes right on its own terms. It's sort of, mm. it, it has a sort of almost sort of religious ideological element to it mm. um, where you don't need evidence and you don't need reason and science because mm. it's fundamentally right. We're fighting evil and therefore we are, we are, we are right. And, and, and because it's been it's been sort of framed in these very sort of morally binary terms historically. 
it tends to be very polarised. And I think the sort of populist politicians who use the war on drugs to show how tough they are and to show how they're fighting mm. this wicked evil, they've kind of argued themselves into a, into a corner because once you've nailed your colours to the mast in such clear binary terms for so long, it becomes very entrenched and it's very difficult to, to, to back away from that because any step away from a very sort of resolute war on drugs mm. is somehow synonymous with weakness or surrender. And politicians don't like to be seen as, as weak. They default to sort of this tough on drugs posturing. Um, and, and the war on drugs becomes kind of, you know, it becomes a political device rather than a, a sort of rational policy. But I think things are changing. So I think people are wising up to the failure, the long term failures of drug policy. I think organisations like Transform and our partners around the world have provided a very effective critique of those failures. People see those failures in their daily lives now. The fact that drug use is increasing and drug-related deaths are increasing, drug-related crime is increasing. As a policy, it just doesn't work. It, it, it's very, very counterproductive. Um, and so the drug war rhetoric is ringing increasingly hollow. And it's not just that the critique has become more meaningful, people are beginning to be exposed to alternative approaches. So you, you can't just have a critique. You have to have a vision of an alternative that people can understand and buy into. And organisations like Transform around the world have been making this case, I think, clearly for long enough now that it started to have some mainstream traction in the public debate, amongst academics, amongst increasing number of uh, numbers of policymakers and opinion formers and, and, and sort of mainstream media. And now we have examples of legal cannabis markets, for example, in the US, in Canada, in Uruguay and elsewhere, and, and decriminalisation models in Portugal and around the world. It, it, it doesn't just seem like empty rhetoric. We can point to real world evidence mm -hmm. of people doing it differently, people doing it better, people getting better outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it feels like the pace of change um, in the direction of reform is now accelerating as a result. So, I mean, we, we keep banging away at it, but it, it feels like we are actually getting somewhere now. Well, I think one of the great achievements that, uh, that you and Danny uh, should take credit for is actually insisting that there was a debate before you guys <laughs> came on the scene. You know, it was people weren't prepared to talk about drugs and talk about drug policy because, that again, just to talk about it was seen as somehow treasonous, which is, of course, is exactly what wars do. You know, there's this famous adage, when it war, or reason is treason, and you were actually bringing reason in. But it must have been quite hard to start yeah, with. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. And, we're, you know, we're, when, when we started back in the, in the late 90s, we were often sort of portrayed as these sort of crazy fringe extremists. Mm. And it was seen, you know, that but you, you'd say, look, we think we need to legalise and regulate drugs. And people would say, are you mad? Drugs mm. kill people. Why, why mm. would you want to, why, why would you want to legalise that? And so we had to not just sort of provide a critique, we had to provide a language and a framework of understanding why this needed to happen and provide people with the sort of conceptual and rhetorical tools for making the case. Mm. So that's, you know, that's another part of Transform's work, not just to critique, not just to spell out uh, a vision of what a regulatory system that would replace prohibition would look like, but also to provide the tools and the, the concepts and the framework of understanding for people to talk about this to different audiences, because it is fundamentally quite counterintuitive. I mean, why would you mm -hmm. legalise something that, you know, a lot of people are very fearful of and see as very dangerous? It's quite a difficult case to make. Mm. It doesn't fit neatly on a bumper sticker. Um, you know, the <laughs> war on drugs is very, it's very simple. It's very appealing. You do, Drugs are bad, you ban them. It's easy. Mm -hmm. That is a good bumper sticker. Um, for us to say, actually, we've got these very quite complicated, the devil's in the detail, and we've got these complicated regulatory systems, and we think certain licensing regimes would work for different drugs according to their risks, mm. and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's quite a complicated case to make, and we have to help people learn how to make that case with different audiences because you know whether it's parents or whether it's church groups or whether it's young people or whether it's conservatives or left-wing people social justice campaigners there's there's a whole range of different audiences and they all bring mm -hmm. different things to the table so one of the key things we've done is also to provide a series of materials on how to make the arguments mm -hmm. and all that stuff's on our on our website as well so let, well you've touched on this now so let's just make it clear for for our listeners so the, Explain to them and how you see the difference between regulated markets, legal markets, decriminalised markets. These are terms which uh, I think can confuse people. Do you want to sort of 
give us your clarity on that, please? I'm glad you've asked that because these are things that people are often confused about. So, so decriminalisation, just to be clear, these aren't necessarily formally defined legal terms, but generally in the political debate, decriminalisation refers to removing criminal sanctions for certain low-level drug offences, usually possession of drugs for personal use or possession of a small amount of drugs for personal use. So it means that a a possession offence, personal use, is no longer criminalised, but it can still be subject to uh, civil or administrative sanctions like fines or treatment assessments or other things. So This is the policy that's been implemented in Portugal and various other European countries and other countries around the world. So it's quite widespread. There's 30 or 40 countries that now have some form of decriminalised personal possession and use for cannabis or, in many cases, all drugs. Now, that's distinct from legalisation which is about changing the legal status of production and supply as well. So legalisation is about making something illegal, legal. And legalisation, there's a lot of confusion here as well, because legalisation is a process, not really a policy. The policy endpoint is a regulated market, and regulation is how the government intervenes to uh, control different elements of the market, production, supply, availability, and usage. So that's things like licensing of vendors, control of uh, information on packaging, who can access the market, what products you can buy, where, how much they cost, tax levels and all that kind of stuff. How we regulate alcohol and tobacco licensing is a good example. And those are obviously legal, licensed, regulated drugs. So Mm -hmm. decriminalisation is about removing criminal sanctions. Legalisation is the process of making something legal. And regulation is the nature of the government interventions in the market once something is legal. And and there is an enormous amount of variety in how you choose to regulate it. It can be very strictly regulated, or you can have a very sort of uh, light touch regulation, like we have historically had with alcohol and tobacco, which isn't necessarily what we would advocate for uh, different drugs in the future. But obviously, different drugs would be regulated in different ways. More, More risky drugs would be more strictly regulated, Less risky drugs would be like, you know, caffeine products or cannabis would probably be less strictly regulated than cocaine or uh, MDMA or amphetamines or, or heroin, for example. So obviously your great success over the last 20 years or the great the greatest change has been in terms of cannabis, isn't it? But you've also been very influential in changing policy. I think you helped design the Uruguay policy. Would you tell us about that and about the, that remarkable president who's... Uh, He's really gone out on a limb to uh, to make change there. Yeah, well, I mean, Uruguay, is a, it, it is a fascinating story. It kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, you know, we mm. monitor these things. And we, it, it, when, when we heard that uh, Uruguay was looking to explore cannabis regulation, we, we hadn't really had any uh, sign of that <laughs> coming. But uh, the policy process of change can, can happen in different ways. And so many of the, the US state reforms have been led by votes, so ballot initiatives at, mm-hmm. at a state mm-hmm. level. Uh, led by activists and, um, you know, campaigners, uh, a sort of bottom-up process of, of, of voter-based change. In Uruguay, it was much more about principled leadership. You had a leader who was uh, a one-term mm-hmm. leader. You know, he, he was he didn't have any political ambitions. He wanted to do the right thing for his country. <laughs> it seems, seems such a strange concept. <laughs> we'll get back to the interview in just a second. I just want to thank all the drug science community members for your continued support. Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a drug science community member, you'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all drug science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, have, have a, a head of state showing genuine principled leadership, but yeah. and he, you know, he in his own way, he decided that the war on drugs was clearly not working, that it was in, enriching organised crime. He didn't want to see Uruguay go the way that some other Latin American countries had gone to becoming sort of borderline narco states, mm. and he thought the first important step was to regulate uh, one of the drugs at the the safer end of the the drug risk spectrum, which is obviously cannabis, obviously not risk-free, but 
not mm. not in the same risk category as, as cocaine or heroin. And so he advocated uh, reform. And so he then set up a process, invited a range of experts from different fields around the world to come to Uruguay and feed into that process. They they looked around at who, who'd been doing work in this, come, came across Transform, liked the cut of our jib, and we were invited down there. We went down there for a few weeks and we worked with the policymakers and their lawmakers and their medical groups and their different parliamentary committees. And we thrashed out what, what a policy should look like. Um, they didn't do everything we suggested, but they, 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 they took on board a lot of our recommendations, along with the other experts who were invited down there. And they came up with a really quite strictly regulated system, which was almost effectively a state monopoly where you would have mm-hmm. strictly re- regulated production with, uh, you know, non-branded packaging, sales of cannabis from from pharmacies and, and an investment in public health education rather than enforcement. And in parallel with that, you'd also have you would, you would allow people to grow a limited amount of plants at home for their personal use. And, it you know, it seems like a very sensible and interesting model. And, it, and it, it's in notable contrast to some of the more commercialized models mm. in some US states, which are much closer to uh, what we would be more familiar with alcohol and tobacco regulation. So more commercialized. And I guess that reflects the, the sort of political environment in Uruguay, which is quite a sort of uh, more left-leaning country compared to the US, which is much more of a sort of market economy type country. Well, that see, obviously gets us into the question of America is a kind of series of experiments, isn't it? Well, I think 30-odd mm. states have now got medical, about 11 states have got recreational. What, are, you, are you monitoring the, the, what's happening there? And can you give us any insights? Yes, we've actually... Um, we are publishing a report very soon. It's called Altered States. It's a kind of review of the different approaches like to the non-medical title. cannabis. So, <laughs> great, great pun, great pun. <laughs> yeah, it's called, it's called Altered States. It's a, it's a it lessons from US cannabis regulation. And um, yeah, so, so it looks at all the different aspects, you know, uh, w- what's happened with taxation, what's happened with social equity models, what's happened with marketing restrictions. And we've tried to draw out the lessons from those those uh, ex- those experiments. And you're right, it's almost like a sort of controlled experiment with a whole range of different mm-hmm. approaches from much more sort of laissez-faire market models through to really quite strictly regulated state monopoly models. And, and looking at Canada as well, we've got another report coming out about Canada, which, which in a similar way to the US has different models across the different provinces. But um, unlike the US, actually is legalized and regulated at a federal level. The US cannabis, weirdly, is still actually illegal mm. at a federal level. Um, and all the all the 11 states who, who uh, have legally regulated adult use, non-medical use markets are actually in violation of, of federal law. So it's quite a strange paradoxical setup in the US at the moment. But nonetheless, all, all these different examples are providing all kinds of interesting data and analysis that the rest of the world can learn from as we move forward. Why do you think the UK is um, rather more rather backward in this compared with um, <laughs> other countries? I'm sure you've got uh, some things to say about that as well, David. But I, you know what, I, I don't really know. Uh, I, it, it's hard to say. I, I, I think that law and order populism has been a, a very much a defining mm. characteristic of the, the kind of public policy, political debate more broadly. And, and within that, there's been a very distinct strand of kind of tough on drugs posturing. It's aided and abetted by, uh, you know, m- much of the media who mm. kind of, you know, they like to pander to this stuff. And it, it seemed to have worked, you know, the, the tough on drugs posturing seems to have been a good political strategy for successive governments. And I don't think it's just conservative governments. The lab, Labour government, no, as you yeah. well know, mm-hmm. was just as bad, arguably worse in some ways. Yeah. But we have had these sort of chinks of light coming through moments of, of sort of public health pragmatism, like the emergence of harm reduction in the kind of late late 80s and 90s, mm-hmm. which happened mm-hmm. under under the Thatcher government. You mm-hmm. know, the Thatcher government had no love for people who use drugs, but there was a, a, a greater crisis there, in this case, yeah. the HIV crisis. And they did roll out, uh, you know, opiate substitution and uh, needle exchange and, and a much more pragmatic public health view as a way of addressing the HIV crisis. So times of crisis can precipitate 
change. I and mean, arguably, we've seen that to some degree with the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has also forced or, or precipitated a certain amount of, of, of rethinking around um, how we deal with vulnerable people who are homeless mm. and using drugs mm. and, uh, mm. you know, a loosening of some prescription guidelines. And it may it may be provoking a bit of thought about things like drug consumption rooms and substitute prescribing of stimulants and some and some other drugs. So things are moving. I think the the, the political capital of uh, tough on drugs posturing is getting less and less. I think that it, it, it it's not working so well. People aren't buying it anymore. Mm. Um, and and the the counter narrative is getting stronger and stronger, thanks to organisations like Transform and thanks to people like yourself and, and and many others who are making a more pragmatic, reasoned case for change. Change is happening, and you can see that in opinion polling. You can see that in uh, the beginnings of policy change um, and the beginnings of increasingly high profile politicians are advocating for change. You know, William Hague advocating for legalisation of cannabis, you know, a a former Tory leader, Um, senior police officers advocating publicly calling for not not even just former police officers, serving police officers, increasing number of academics like yourself. You know, you, you, you've had you, you've been increasingly outspoken on this um, o- over the over recent years. It, it what, one of the things I think Transform and others have done is to make it a a safer space for people to move into. They've cl- created some sort of uh, some language and safe space, and it, it just, and and when other countries start doing it, when the, when the US starts doing it, when Obama endorses experiments with cannabis, cannabis regulation. Um, and when high profile, increasingly high profile figures, people like the Global Commission on Drugs, which is mm. all these Nobel laureates and all these former heads of state, start making you know clear, eloquent cases for change, it becomes easier for other people mm. to do that. And um, we're, we're seeing that process and, and that process is clearly accelerating. Well, I think what you've just said is a perfect example of the enormous enthusiasm and positivity you're a, you're very much a glass <laughs> full man but uh, it is uh, it still disappoints you have me to stay positive. you do yeah but you and i worked together you chaired the the liberal uh, the, the lib dems uh, review of cannabis policy and, uh, and i helped you with that committee for a, and that was that i thought that was going to be a major breakthrough because it was a great report and it, it laid out the you know the the road map to a, a regulated market in the uk but then, of course, the Lib Dems didn't do very well in the election. And it, I, I, I find it weird that <laughs> this is such a big issue. And yet, it, in, in political terms, neither of the two big parties were, are prepared to to respond to the needs of the populace or even the views of the populace, let alone evidence. That's true. I mean, I, you know, you're right. The Lib Dems, you know, I think have a more thoughtful and reasoned drug policy. And it includes regulation of cannabis and um, and that they seem to be open minded about broader reform on other drugs as well, but they haven't quite gone there yet. The Green Party certainly has a, a, a much more progressive drug policy that, that, that we've also, uh, you know, fed into. I mean, we're, we're not a party political organisation. We try very hard to support whoever wants to, no. from whatever political persuasion who wants to, to engage in this debate. The Labour Party, I think, is very important. And uh, there, there are clear signs of change there. So there is now a Labour Party drug law reform group. A lot of the people who are involved in that are part of the new shadow cabinet. You have people like David Lammy, uh, who, who's been very outspoken on, on on the harms of the war on drugs in terms of its discriminatory effect, effects on, on marginalised communities and, and black people in the UK. I, I feel that there are real signs of change in the Labour Party, who are who are you know it, yes the Lib Dems have been very marginalised in Parliament, but the Labour Party is still a very important voice, and and they are speaking up more and more, and I think that we're likely to see them take on a much more proactive drug law reform platform in the coming months and years as we build up to the next election. Um, within the Conservative Party, I mean that the, the part of the problem with the Conservative Party obviously is that it's been consumed with with Brexit for so long now mm. that a lot of these other issues. Mm have got sort of subsumed within that. And um, the drug war, unfortunately, does get drawn into some of these kind of culture war, kind of, you know, social conservative mm. versus liberals type debates. But it is interesting, even in the Conservative Party, there is a there's a clear split. You know, you do have the more authoritarian conservatives. Mm. 
And you do have the more kind of socially liberal sort of free market conservatives. And a lot of the conservative think tanks like the Adam Smith Institute and the Institute for Economic Affairs are very outspoken on the need for drug law reform and have published reports on cannabis regulation, for example. So mm. even within the Conservative Party, there is a, a growing and active debate, even if it comes at it from a slightly different uh, set of values and perspectives. So, again, I think we are seeing progress. It is frustrating. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not delusional about this it is frustrating uh, and progress can feel glacially slow but we are also seeing real change you know we've seen change with medical cannabis we've seen um we, we are grudging seeing, grudging steve <laughs> yeah grudging grudging and frustrating hardly any prescriptions in the end exists <laughs> no yeah of course you're right david i'm not i'm not claiming that we're out of the woods yet but the, the fact that there's any change at all uh, mm -hmm. you know let's let, let's Let's glass half full this. There is progress. It's not coming from central no. government, but no. change is happening locally and it is slowly percolating up. So that things are moving in the UK and there are, despite frustrations, there are also reasons for optimism. And over the years, you know, you, you know, I've been sort of working in this same space as you for about the same time as you really. And one of the arguments it's always put is, well, we can't go it alone. The UN conventions, you know, if we, if we breach the UN conventions, then the whole world will end, you know, there'll be a catastrophe and i get you know conscious of the, you know, the attempt that was made at about 15 years ago to stop bolivia making yeah. the, uh, the cocaine leaf legal and you know pe people from the unodc going to bolivia and pleading with the pr president not to make these leaves legal when they're obviously completely harmless and actually quite useful to live in altitude and you yeah. you have an extraordinary you know you've been working a lot in, in trying to work with the un or for decades i mean it, uh, is there any way we can stop it being so intransigent and, and 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 at least stop it controlling or being an excuse for countries like ours not to do things? Well, I mean, the, the you know the UN conventions um, they are put in place by UN member states to serve the interest of member states, and they are not written in stone. Member states can, by agreement, by consensus, reform and update them. So the possibility exists for system reform at a UN level as well. But obviously, it's very, very difficult to get a consensus on something like cannabis prohibition being ended or cannabis legalisation when you've got these sort of progressive countries like Norway and the Netherlands and, and Uruguay and Canada saying, look, can we can we discuss some of these these reforms? And then you've got, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia and Russia mm -hmm. and China and hardline prohibitionist countries who are absolutely fundamentally politically and ideologically opposed to any any move away from the sort of prohibitionist state of play. But what's happening at the international level is that we're seeing increasing polarisation. You're getting this grouping of reform minded states like the Netherlands and Canada and, you know, Bolivia and Uruguay. who They, they, all, have, they all come at it from slightly different positions. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, they see a need for system wide change at the very least to introduce some flexibility to allow countries to explore some of these things. Um, and then you're seeing a kind of ossification of the hardline prohibitionists. Now, the problem with that is it's not tenable in the long run, because if the system is not uh, meeting the needs of a majority of member states, it will eventually collapse under its own contradictions. Mm -hmm. And the threat of system collapse in terms of the UN conventions means that eventually something has to give. You'll either start to get uh, reform-minded countries defecting from the system en masse, in which case it becomes meaningless, because these things only have power if all the different countries mm -hmm. sign up to yeah. them, or you will get some form of compromise from the hardliners. And it feels like we are moving towards that crunch point. Um, exactly how it's going to play out, it's really not clear. Um, there, there, there are various sort of mechanisms and, and, and political strategies that different people are discussing. But, you know, as the number of reform minded, minded states increases, whether it's just about cannabis or whether it's about, some, uh, you know, drugs more broadly, mm. the pressure on that system will mount and it, it can't be maintained forever. So we are edging towards a kind of mm. threshold. And, you know, it, when, when the US legalises cannabis federally, mm. I think that will be the camel, that, the straw that breaks the camel's back yeah. because, you know, they, they, they are one of the, they are still the kind of global hegemonic country and mm. the UN system can't really sustain one of the key power, power brokers 
you know, Canada is already is a G7 country, but you know, if mm. the US goes as well, something has to give. And and at that point, there will have to be a more fundamental revisiting of those those prohibitionist structures to, in, mm. at the very least, allow individual countries or groups of countries to explore uh, regulatory alternatives to prohibition. Exactly how it plays out, I don't know, but but some there is movement there as well. But one of the things you told me last time we at the Drug Science uh, Committee was how a lot of the UN subgroup, sub-organisations have taken on the drug problem from a human rights perspective uh, and have come out for supporting the idea that individuals shouldn't be persecuted. Yeah. There should be human rights for drug users. Yes, that's absolutely right. They're, they're, I mean, a lot of people don't really understand how the UN works, but they're, mm. they're, there's, there are the UN member state entities like the uh, like the General Assembly mm. and and the, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs is the key drugs on where all the different member states meet up and discuss global drug policy. There is also the, the institutions of the UN itself. So things like the World Health Organization and the Human Rights mm. Council uh, and um, the, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. There's about 30 different institutions. UNICEF, UN Women, um, mm-hmm. uh, the UN Drug Development Programme, and so on. All of those UN institutions have ag- now agreed a common position on drugs. This this was only formalised uh, last year. Was it always even this year? It's, it's very recent. And it does advocate for ending the criminalisation of people who use drugs. So this is, a, this is now a pan-UN policy position that people who use drugs should not be criminalised purely for their use and that drug policy should be rooted in human rights principles and public health principles and the wider goals of the UN Charter. It's not been nearly as well publicised as I think it should, because you've got all of the UN institutions, so the human rights ones, the public health ones, the World Health Organization, all calling for decriminalisation um, and advocating that member states adopt policies that follow this, this statement. So we are seeing a, a dramatic kind of evolution of the high level debate in favour of um, away from the kind of ideological moral binaries of a war on drugs towards a much more reasoned, principled, pragmatic position based on public health and uh, uh, human rights. So, yeah, progress there too. When you told me, I, I, that was one of the most exciting things I'd heard in in decades, you know, because that is a, as a fundamental shift to put human rights at the centre rather than punishment. So what, we should publish it, and you know, this this podcast will do a little bit for that. But maybe we should write it up, Steve. Absolutely. I mean, and you can find details about it. If, if anyone wants to find out about it, you can you can visit the Transform blog. We've written about it, or you can you can mm-hmm. just search it up on the UN. It's called the UN Common Position Statement. Um, and there was actually part of that statement was was to assemble a task force. It was called a task team. I don't know what the difference mm. between a force and a team is, but but the the UN task team with um, experts from all the different agencies, and they produced a a, a, a brilliant report analysing the lessons from the last 10 years of uh, global drug policy that was a a, a withering indictment of the global war on drugs. It just said that, you know, hasn't achieved any of its goals. It's it's fueled human rights abuses. It's fueled crime. It's fueled ill health and HIV and death. Um, and, and and we need to be talking about this other stuff. So, yeah, the, 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 the institutions of the UN, the UN uh, mm. organisations, are very much ahead of the UN member states. And that's and as as it should be, you know, they should be showing leadership. And at last, they actually are doing that. But it hasn't had nearly enough publicity. So yeah, I'd encourage all your listeners to check that out and um, link it, share it, publicise it. Um, I can post some links on Transform uh, Twitter feed or my Twitter feed afterwards. And, and, and you can That'll share. be very helpful. Yes, do yes. read that. It's, it's incredibly important. Of course, one of the other things that you've thought a lot about is the destabilizing impact particularly of cocaine in, in Latin America but also now I think also in West Africa when where that's becoming a one of the sort of stepping stones from South America to Europe what is the solution to this problem when you have you know you have the West wanting a lot of cocaine um, and the Latin America providing it but suffering the consequences of uh, of the of the interdiction in the war and, and I, I, that leads me to this, you know, to the question that you, I know you are working on a, a model for perhaps a regulated cocaine market, which may be the only solution. But so, so share with us, you know, your thinkings of how we deal with that huge, the Latin problem. 
Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. The cocaine market is worth something in the region of $100 billion a year. You know, untold billions, probably trillions have been spent trying Mm. to uh, eradicate it. And yet it gets bigger and bigger every year. So the idea that you can police this market into oblivion is clearly ludicrous. All it's done is give control of this vast market to organised criminal groups who operate internationally. And you're right, they, they, they are fueling violence, uh, destabilising ent- entire countries and regions, and nothing good has come out of it. And so, the I mean, the idea that you would somehow have a legally regulated cocaine market may seem very disconcerting to people, but we, we, we have to ask from a purely logical, pragmatic position, mm. what is the alternative? And if the alternative is the status quo, which is, you know, Pablo Escobar and and, mm. and friends in control of the show and all the carnage that comes with that, then maybe it's just a lesser of two evils argument. But, we, you know, we really, if, if it's governments in control of the market or gangsters in control, we have mm. to choose governments. Now, yes, there are problems with governments too, obviously, but, you know, responsible state agencies, public health agencies, licensing agencies in control of that market who are able to ensure that the product is what it says on the packet they can put health warnings they can restrict access to young people or vulnerable other vulnerable groups they can use the the regulatory levers to try and encourage safer patterns of use or divert mm-hmm. people to safer behaviors it's got to be preferable to the current carnage we're seeing at the moment which is increasing cocaine use increasing cocaine related harms mm-hmm. and all the carnage of the illegal market so we are publishing a book uh, that's not just about cocaine, it's about stimulants more broadly, so MDMA mm. and amphetamines okay. as well. Um, and it's very, it's very diff- these are very difficult questions, but we, we are coming up with what we think would be the optimal approach to uh, a legally regulated market for these that balances those conflicting interests, allows us to shrink or reduce the criminal trade without um, encouraging use, but allowing public health thinking to infuse the regulatory system to try and protect health as well as reducing uh, some of the criminal justice arms of prohibition. It's not easy, but we're, we're doing our best. And we won't get it all right, but hopefully if it provokes some discussion, debate, uh, that can only be a good thing. So I mean, maybe it's an unfair question, but which of the, which of the Latin countries do you think will be the first to, uh, to go down that, the market route? Well, I mean, the, the, the previous president of Colombia, President Santos, whilst he was president, he openly, you know, floated the idea of a legalised cocaine market. So it's, yeah. it's not entirely alien. And since he stepped down uh, last year, he's since, since joined the Global Commission on Drugs, who oh, advocate right. for a, a legally regulated drugs market, including cocaine. And, you know, I've worked with the Global Commission as well, uh, mm. drafting their, their recent report on, on regulation. And not just our former presidents, but serving presidents have also floated the possibility of legalization and regulation. A lot of those countries, they feel like they have gone along with the, 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 the war on drugs, which is very much a kind of North American and European program, a kind of mm. a, a sort of Western construct, yeah, Western political yeah. construct. They fought this war on, the, on our behalf, and they've also carried the brunt of its failures exactly. and its harms. And they're saying, you know, why should we have our countries being devastated to meet your needs for your your demand for cocaine? I mean, that's put in very simplistic terms. Obviously, it's a bit more nuanced than that. But I, I think some of those Latin American producer countries will actually be leading the charge to mm. on the debate around alternatives to prohibition as we move forward. And I think that's already been the case. I mean, you know, that the big UN General Assembly General Assembly special session in 2016 the UNGAS on drugs was called at the behest of Guatemala, uh, Mexico and Colombia. And those countries said, we want to have a a general assembly meeting on drugs to discuss the failings of the war on drugs and what alternatives might look like. So that's all that that high level debate is already beginning. And, you know, the countries that are most impacted by the failings of the war on drugs are the ones who are uh, in many cases driving that debate. Yeah, well, let's hope uh, let's hope your book is as well received as the previous ones, and it does Im- implement change. And uh, we're going to have to wind this up now. But I think what the, the point you c- you're making it's got me thinking about how we might we might best try to present the argument to the British people. And when you look at 
I mean, the cost of the war on drugs in Britain is, is not trivial, is it? We, we do waste a lot of money. We, I think about half of all the people in our prisons are there because of drug offences. Do you think the economic argument is the one we should be pushing now? Obviously, we've, we've made cases on the moral argument, you know, the human rights argument, but they haven't been well received by some elements of the press. But maybe the economic argument is the one that people eventually will accept. Yeah, I think you're right. Different different arguments, you know, public health arguments, the impact on vulnerable groups or disproportionate outcomes of enforcement. The, these arguments will all work for different different mm. audiences. Human rights arguments, libertarian arguments. Uh, you know, there, there are lots. There are lots yeah. of good arguments for change. I think the economic arguments is certainly a strong one. It may be. I, I think it's likely that it's going to be one that appeals to um, this government more than mm. you know social justice arguments. Perhaps. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. I don't want to be too cold and cynical about them, but you know, economic arguments. And I think there will be an increasing urgency for economic arguments, given the 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 the, the COVID crisis and exactly. the, the economic. Yeah problems that we are heading into you know the, the economy is in real trouble the government's been borrowing hundreds of billions to deal with this crisis entirely rightly but now there's a massive hole in the public finances the idea that we spend billions on a entirely counterproductive uh, enforcement regime that then creates a whole load of secondary costs and at the same time uh, we're handing billions in profits to organized crime groups that could be part of a legally regulated market I think it will probably provoke change certainly around cannabis i think mm. that the cannabis debate will maybe be driven significantly by the potential uh savings and and tax revenues of a, of a legal cannabis market i don't think the uk will be first but um there are countries in europe who are now looking at legally regulating cannabis luxembourg is another place where i've been working with mm. the government looking at their proposals for legal cannabis market in luxembourg again who knew that luxembourg mm. was going to be this crucible of change a tiny little country a bit like uruguay in some ways a, a yeah. tiny little country in the middle of a vast continent that is surprisingly in many ways going to be leading the the, the charge in europe but they are. Um, that's happening. Other countries are close behind. Denmark, Spain, Italy, possibly uh, uh, Norway, Switzerland. There's a whole bunch of European countries, I think, are very close to mo moving on legalised cannabis. And I think when some of those countries go, it will provide the space for a more sophisticated debate in the UK, because I think the high level, you know, people at high level will feel safer to talk about it and and when they do hopefully they will <laughs> they will call transform and and, and your good self and, and we can have a sensible discussion like we did with the Lib Dems. Well I, I hope when COVID is over we'll see you going into number 10 to bring the voice of reason around drugs to the current government. <laughs> they could certainly do with it. The voice of reason that is not doesn't have to be me. <laughs> I'll, I'll nominate you, Steve. Steve, it's been a really great pleasure to chat with you and uh, you've covered such a My lot and in such an informative way. Thank you. And thanks to you and Danny for all the work you've done. You know, it's been an inspiration. It's our pleasure. And the rest of the Transform team, of course. And the rest of the team, yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It's clear that we've got a lot to be thankful to Steve and Transform for. And... Uh, I'm sure that over the next 20 years, if British drug policy changes, he'll be one of the main factors driving this. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you want to join the community of drug science, go onto the website and, uh, and feel free to sign up because the drug science community is what keeps drug science telling the truth about drugs. Thank you.